Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company. Uh, we are new digital year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices from t film, television, and theater. And today we are joined by the wonderful Ben Kasulke, who is an incredibly talented cinematographer who has done films ranging from Lynn Shelton's movies throughout her career to Safety Not Guaranteed, Mike Birbiglia's comedy specials, and so many more, and also recently directed his first feature film with Banana Split and is a writer and director on HBO's Room 104 as well. Thanks so much for, for joining us. And I wanted to ask, you know, particularly because your work as a, a cinematographer in particular is so rooted in having a camera and being on location. Um, has there been anything that you've still been moving forward project wise in that realm during this time or has everything just come to a complete standstill? You know, I no, I would love to say everything's come to a complete standstill, but um, uh, I know people are working and New York is sort of opening back up. My friends in Canada are shooting a lot. Um, yeah. People are, we had a shoot uh, outside the house in Los Angeles the other day. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, it's a kind of strange issue. Uh, you know, there's been some offers for work, but um, I'm not 100%, you know, uh, feeling safe to go back yet. And uh, I know everyone's doing their best as far as coming up with safety protocols, but it's all sort of um, based on assumptions. And I think this virus, so we were just learning the sort of tip of the iceberg of it. So I haven't really moved forward with any physical production. There's been a lot of uh, writing. So I'm, I'm sort of working with a few different writers to develop some TV series stuff and then um, have a couple other little things cooking here and there. So, but mostly writing and kind of trying to be safe and staying home. That's perfect. And in terms of writing, do you prefer when it's a collaborative co-writing experience? Because you've been you've been pretty honest about the fact that it's not necessarily the process that you love the most in the entire filmmaking process. So does it make it easier when you have that creative collaborator? It, yes, it definitely does. I mean, the collaborating, I, I'm in this 100% for the collaboration. I, I like community and I like building community. I like friendships. I like lifelong friendships and kind of building my film family. And um, part of that is comes in writing. And I think, um, uh, conversely, writing is really difficult for me. It's hard for me to structure out. I can I can structure out a 12 hour shoot day. And if you, you know, if you were to hire me and say, hey, we're we're shooting for eight straight weeks, uh, this is what it looks like. I can I can mentally prepare myself for that and um, make it happen. But um, the sort of self discipline of uh, being home and setting a writing schedule. I, I just personally find it really uh, difficult. I've been, I've been struggling with it for a while. So to have not only a sort of like fun partner in crime with a collaborator, but also to be beholden interpersonally to deadlines really, really helps me out. I find it pretty liberating. It's not the kind of uh, scenario that, that boxes me in a corner. Yeah, is part of the motivation for you to keep pushing past that discomfort in, in writing more? given to do with the fact that you're pushing more into directing and that's really the direction that you're hoping your career will go further into? Um, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't want to give up shooting. So I want to do both, and which is to me makes total sense and kind of coming at, from outside of Hollywood and joining this community full time a little later in my life. Uh, it, it kind of makes sense to want to do all of that stuff. I, I just think making films is making films. Um, it gets a little trickier when you're talking to people in the industry, agencies, um, I think it's easier to, to sort of market a, a client as one thing or the other. But um, yeah, I do want to uh, I do want to push past this sort of it's not even writer's block. It's just sort of I think it's a real personal reaction to um, I had some pretty like intense academic schooling the last few years of high school and, and all of college. And I just wrote a lot. And I woke up and went to the library and just like, studied and wrote and studied and wrote. And after six years of that, like just kind of leaves a taste in my mouth. I'm like, I'd rather be outside. I'd rather be talking to people. I don't want to sit with a laptop and like write all the time, but I'm trying to push through it and I'm an adult and I know that I will. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, it's tricky. And then like to have that, that sort of career shift that um, would want that where I would want to sort of prioritize solo writing uh, coincide with the pandemic. It's been really tricky. You know, it's, it, it should be a very uh, obvious procedure, but um something about it with the with the world changing so fast and uh, it's just made it a little tricky for me to to concentrate in the way that I wish I could. 
Yeah, in terms of the academic side of film that you were just mentioning, because you, you did go and study film, um, there's always such an interesting discourse in our, interest, in our industry about the value and whether people should go to film school or whether they shouldn't, because there are things that you can learn on a film set that they're not teaching you, but then there's a community that you build and certain things that you get the opportunity to really try and fail at, which is an invaluable thing. So I was really interested in, in what you found the value to be for yourself and maybe some of the things that you really felt were missing a little bit that you got once you stepped onto sets a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, um, I came out of like a, I did uh, public school, this real small town in um, northern New York where I grew up. And then uh, the last two years of school, um, I went away to sort of a, a uh, very progressive kind of we make good people academically tough boarding school um, that that sort of helped me redirect a lot of my energy uh, as far as academics go. And so I knew I wanted to do film. I knew that that was where the future was going to be for me um, professionally. And that I artistically, that was that's what spoke to me was cinema. But um, I was concerned about not being able to balance out um, the sort of uh, liberal arts end of it. So um, when I went to school, I went to Ithaca College, uh, which is uh, upstate New York, and um, they had a, a really good, technically a really good film school at the time. Um, but what the what they really had that sort of made them stick out for me back then was that the um, the Bachelor of Science of film production degree that they offered only required one technical film class and one liberal arts based film class a semester and you could take anything else you wanted so you could minor in anything and Ithaca College has five schools within it that are all fairly diverse um, so I, I you know as far as learning how to make films it was fantastic I came from a small town there was there was one filmmaker in our town um, that he and I didn't really overlap um, so there was no technical knowledge um i'd taken some photography classes but i had no idea how to how to shoot 16 millimeter and by the end of the second semester at, at ithaca college we were shooting 16 millimeter um and so i got the technical stuff and then there was the the liberal arts end of it the sort of critique cultural critique film studies screenwriting um history of, of cinema like that stuff i i wanted to learn anyway so that was wonderful um but the real sort of um the real sort of plus of this whole scenario was that in the background I was taking electroacoustic music and um, all sorts of literature classes and history and um, uh, comparative religions and like I was just able to sort of fill the rest of my brain. Um, and I think that, that the uh, debate about film schools um, really, when I hear it, I, maybe I'm just projecting within, but it feels to me like the debate with film schools is really about technical filmmaking and not about um, balancing yourself out with a with an education, um, and and maybe that's because the sort of myth of NYU or AFI or um, uh, these sort of high powered American film schools is that you go there just to make films, um, and on a graduate level, yes. But I I just I would urge um, people thinking about going to a film school, especially young people, to find a way to do it that includes um multiple interdisciplinary areas of study uh and sort of rounding out your educational experience and more importantly just finding finding a way to like learn how to think and to gain wisdom you know i i, I don't know of that many you know 18 year olds right out of high school that have a have a very articulate um backlog of stories that they need to tell because they're 18 years old and they're still learning um, but I, I know a lot of them that could do with learning, <laughs> you know, that, that, that an, uh, an education would help. So um, I would, you know, a technical film school, I, you do learn a lot, you do make a community. Um, it is a very specific skill set that if you're not living in an industry town, it's hard to come by. Yeah. But um, to only prioritize that at the expense of a m maybe more holistic education, I would caution against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in terms of the, the technical aspect, that's obviously something that in your time in the industry already has shifted monumentally in the last just 10 to 15 years as we're going more and more into digital and film sadly is becoming a much rarer form to be working with. And, and I was curious about the way and that that's really affecting your process and the way that you're preparing before you walk onto a set as well as just the way that you are working on set with your team. Obviously you can move much faster, but you're having to light things very differently and they're two very different skill sets that you're bouncing between still. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, um, I, when I finished film school, we were shooting Super 16 and finishing on Avid. 
uh, in the very last week right before graduation, they called in a few of the film students to meet with a representative from Apple who was showing off the first version of Final Cut Pro. And I, I remember looking at it and being like, this is totally awesome. Um, it's, it's like Avid that everybody could kind of have in their house, but I couldn't figure out how you would um, ever conform a camera negative to it. Like it was right at the, the, the sort of chapter mark of end of film, beginning of digital, and then cut to two, three years later, Indigen and a lot of these low budget um, indie film companies out of New York, which is going strictly digital and making feature films. But um, I was sort of the last kind of graduating era of, of um, uh, kids coming out of film school that were you know, shooting film and finishing um, on like work print and you know finishing uh, cut negative and making film prints and um, it, all of that all of that changed so fast when I got out of school um, and now yeah I, you know I began shooting with uh, with film and um, I would still shoot film if, if I could convince a producer to pay for it it's a tough um, it's a tough battle to fight I love film and I and would always prefer to shoot it if it's right for the project but um, yeah, these days, uh, yeah, it, it was a, it was a crazy sort of um, accelerated learning curve, you know, like I knew how to write, I knew how to light for my eye uh, for, for film stock, and then I knew how to measure for that. But, um, and I, I, one of the best teachers I ever had just said, just light it so it looks good, figure out the math later, figure out how it, how it exposes, use your meter after you've got it in a place where it feels right, you know, emotionally, visually, um, serving the story. Um, and so that was, it was great to have that because eventually, um, people started to light off of monitors and, uh, um, when you're shooting digital, there's this calibrated monitor at a DIT station that, um, shows you quote unquote, exactly what you're, what you're going to get. Uh, and when you press, when you press the record button. And so, um, I'm glad I learned to light things to eye, uh, because oddly, like after this transition out of film and into early digital, and then finally to, a um, a digital that to me, an era of digital to me that feels a little more like the cinema that I would want to be experiencing. You know, I, I think the the release of the um, Aria Alexa kind of changed the digital world for me. It, it took things from uh, trying to sort of force uh, a camera system to look like a movie in my head to just having a camera that could make a, what I thought should be a movie in my head. Um, but uh, when people uh, started to uh, shoot digital all the time with calibrated monitors all of a sudden you were lighting to your eye again you just had to do it through a video screen um so it, you know e either way you're sort of light you're you're thinking about story you're thinking about character you're thinking about mood you're thinking about where uh visually where you are uh in the continuity of a story as you're as you're creating images and um uh but you're no longer just doing it to your eye through an eyepiece and checking with a meter now you're uh, you're at a monitor and there's um, an entire technical crew that's that, that's working together and I try to um, uh, establish a, a real sense of collaboration on set so um, you know everybody kind of does their first wave of work and then we gather around the monitor the gaffer the the key grip and myself and we just check in and do notes and it's it's great and it's collaborative and it's wonderful but it's no longer through the eyepiece it's on a it's on a monitor for all of us to work off of. Yeah. In a similar vein, I wanted to ask you about the difference between when you're working on something like filming a special with Mike Birbiglia, which is in a very controlled environment, you can really control exactly what the lighting is going to look like, versus when you're working on a movie like Land Ho, where you're capturing this incredibly beautiful Icelandic landscape, and you're really not in control of the elements. And again, that's just two very different ways of working. Land Ho was actually a big reason why I ended up going to Iceland in the end. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, with, with, I'll start with the, the Mike Birbiglia end of it, because that, maybe that's almost a more traditional sort of filmmaking approach. Like, I've um, done a, a three specials with him now. The last one, we were at the Cherry Street Theater in New York, and um, it was a Broadway show. And, you know, all of a sudden, it was like, Mike Birbiglia, who we've all been working with for years, is on Broadway. It's a huge deal. The end of a, a, a run that started at a smaller theater moved to Broadway, and um, and so we wanted to uh, capture the experience of the Broadway show because um, how many people can go to Broadway, but they, you know, everybody hears about the, you know, everybody knows about Dear Evan Hansen, everybody knows about The Lion King, but how many people really can go see that? And all of a sudden there's Netflix and you can replicate that, that experience to some degree visually. Um, so, you know, Mike had a, a show that was very much um, set up in a particular way 
And what was kind of lovely about that is we just took a day with Mike and myself and uh, Seth Barris, the director, and a calibrated monitor, like we were talking about, uh, and the lighting director of the, of the show. And we just um, went through every lighting cue uh, and adjusted it so it looked as close uh, on the video as it did to the experience of watching in the theater. Um, and it, 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 what's lovely about that, it is, it's a very controlled environment. It's a, it's a theater with no, none of the elements are coming in. There's no weather in there. There's no clouds. There's no sun. Um, and so that's, you know, in a situation like that, you're really uh, trying to, um, you're trying to match an experience for someone. It's, it's not creating from scratch. You don't start with a, the absence of light in a black box and then build the story from there. It's like the story's sort of there. What you're trying to do is sort of conjugate it from one medium to another. Um, something like Land Ho, which I was, I was fortunate enough to be called to do uh, second unit photography and kind of be the gaffer and I'm, I'm in it for a few seconds. Um, and the, something like that, uh, you know, Andrew Reed was, was the, the DP on that. He had a long running relationship with um, Aaron Katz uh, and Martha Stevens, the co-directors. Uh, but what what was nice about that was that I'd, I'd had experience with uh, with Andrew Reed, and I'd had experience with the, this type of kind of off the cuff, um, uh, semi improvised filmmaking. So they they brought me along to sort of help out. Um, well, the best the get best part of part of that, I guess, was the the days where they would just send myself and a camera and, and a few crew members and just be like, "All right, have fun. Like, go go shoot Iceland." And, and that's like a dream, you know, it's, and uh, some days um, we would plan the night before to go shoot Iceland and then sideways rain and sleet and, you know, white out snow would, would kind of put the kibosh on that. Uh, and then other days um, we thought we'd be shooting some scene that would take four hours and we got a wonderful scene in an hour and a half and I would jump in a van and, and take off and get the stuff that we got, uh, that we were scheduled for on a inclement weather day. So um, that is much more about knowing that you have X amount of time, X amount of resources, and just trusting that if you have two or three days in a row where you're not able to go shoot beautiful Iceland, um, that it's gonna happen somewhere down the line and that you can, you can move indoors or maybe that day you are shooting ugly Iceland and you don't know why, but uh, you know, for the editor, um, you can find emotional beats that might um, uh, coincide or dance against uh, the emotional beats of the story and the characters. and so. There might be some some moments where the skies are grayer, and you don't you know you shoot it because it it looks it has an emotional value to it, but you don't know until the film comes from the other end of the edit how that's going to interplay with the narrative itself. Yeah, there was something I wanted to ask you about in terms of the way that you've talked about working with David Gordon Green as a frequent collaborator, and the way that he really can take something that on the page looks very straightforward and is really just two people in a singular space having a conversation, and without you know turning it into a large production, that he can really make it incredibly visually engaging. So I was interested in how that collaboration works between the two of you, and and how that's really taught you to look in, at spaces and think about space set up differently as a result. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I met David many, many years ago. He was doing the, um, the, the festival tour for George Washington. So this must have been 2000, 2001, maybe. Um, and he, uh, and, you know, we sort of knew each other. We ran in the same circles and Todd Rohall and uh, had a, we had a bunch of crossover through NCSA guys. And, um, but we, we, yeah, we ended up working together starting on, um, on Red Oaks. And, uh, you know, he has such an impressive body of work. It's really like visually, it's um, pretty stunning. And um, just, uh, I was kind of intimidated just technically to see, you know, how he worked and how we were gonna make this thing happen. And, and he, yeah, he has this knack of like something on the page that's just two people talking. Um, David has this way of, of um, kind of throwing like a constructive monkey wrench and the in character blocking. Um, so what you think would be two people sitting at a, at a bar or something, it, all of a sudden someone's kind of moving around or people aren't quite facing each other. Um, or, you know, David will just get an image in, a head, in his head. You know, he had one where I think um, it was a scene in Red Oaks where someone's, someone's girlfriend calls, she's really mad at him because he's kind of being a lame old boyfriend. Um, and he's trying to explain himself because there was a reason he didn't show up on time. And, uh, and she kind of slams the phone down and David just had this image of him putting his head uh, kind of like through the wall and holding the, the phone up uh, and you sort of lose track of his head and his body just becomes this little statue. 
and David built the blocking of the whole scene just to lead up to this one image in his head. And um, I just, I love that, A, he just committed to the image that he wanted to build to. So like there's this little pyramid and at the apex is the one thing that David saw in his head from the page. Um, but B, that he, he didn't care that it was not going to feel like a TV show or a Hollywood movie, that, that people are kind of moving all around. And um, what's, what's sort of lovely and the sort of trick that, that um, David and I kind of had during that, I don't think he came up with it then, but it was a trick that sort of worked for him. And um, I find really works for me is that, you know, if you know there's sort of a playing field where characters can do their thing, um, we'll put two cameras on, on dollies with some zoom lenses and just just have a move the whole way through it. And we'll, we'll shoot one or two takes like that and then start to see what feels right, what feels wrong. And um, yeah, there's, it's just, uh, you know, and he's, it feels in the moment like you're moving a camera just to move it. But when you see how it's cut together, uh, that some of that, that visual style that people really know him for, that's when the sort of magic kind of happens. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it was wonderful because I, I had done a lot of films where um, you know, the majority of the narrative turns into two or three people, everybody's in a room, they start talking to each other. Let's find the, the prettiest and uh, most non-intrusive way for these actors to do their work. Um, and it's a great way to work, but it's not, a, um, it's not a methodology that prioritizes cinematography, I don't think. You know, you can, you can make it look good, but it's um, in my head when, it, when I'm in those modes, I can always think of a way to make it look better, but it's very difficult. And so, what was nice is after years of doing sort of um, semi-improvised films, uh, it, I kind of bumped into David and started working together on Red Oaks and he had a way to kind of sort of improvise his way into images that he loved, but also to just trust that if we kind of made a little playing field for the actors to do their thing and David knows actors and knows motion and he knows his, his level of kind of encyclopedic, uh, encyclopedic cinema knowledge is so deep um, that he just, I never felt like, you know, if we spent the time setting up these little playing fields that he, we were going to get in trouble. Like it was very rare that something didn't work. You know, it would be kind of like, we can do this better and we'd do two, three takes. And it was like, all of a sudden we had this miraculous little scene. And, um, and it was never a way that I would have found on my own. I found it because of David. Um, and I think that he, I, he and I found each other at a point where like he had done some really big budget stuff and also some really tiny budget stuff and commercials. And he didn't, as a, as a director, he's like, I don't care how long it takes to, to put up the two dollies. We'll just do it. I know it's going to work. It's going to be fine. And, and to have that coming from a director and not from a cinematographer uh, is a, is a really big deal. You know, a, a cinematographer saying like, just put up two long dolly moves. And like all of a sudden you're telling your assistant director, it's going to be 40 minutes uh is a big deal but to have the director say no no we do this it's two setups and we're done with the scene for the day it's like it's amazing it's very it's very fast and it's very cinematic um yeah yeah yeah, and because you were mentioning working relationships with actors, I think, you know, as a cinematographer, that's not something that people necessarily think about being a huge part of your job description, but yeah. every single day you're part of creating a really comfortable and trusting environment with the actors. You're someone that they're looking to in terms of feedback on their performance because you literally see every single thing that happens in front of the camera and you have that eye to know what works. Um, and I was just really interested in in how you approach that and how you like to communicate with actors to to work to create that space for them. Yeah, yeah, no, I thanks for thanks for saying that. I mean, it is, it's a huge, I think it's a huge part of the job. I, I feel like there's, you know, there's every shade of cinematographer in the world and some people land in the more technical end of things. Some people are more in the interpersonal end of things and there's every every place on the gamut. But um, I, for me, I, I really think that uh, it's about working with people. And um, this, this industry is really difficult if you don't enjoy it. It's not... Um, it's not like a nine to five job. It's 12 hour days minimum. And um, it's a lot of time away from families and it's a lot of time away from loved ones. And, um, you know, over, over the years, I've seen that it can be extremely hard on, on relationships and children. And, um, and so I, I think that you really need to go the extra distance to kind of create your work family. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll almost across the board when I'm working on anything, I'll, I'll write all of the principal actors um, usually through pre-production, I'll, I'll forward an email through a producer or something just so it's non-committal, but it, it, you know, they know how to I make sure that they know that I'm really excited to work with them, that I, um, uh, 
that I really want to create a work environment that is conducive to performance and that I know that they're um, you know, sort of putting themselves out there emotionally and that if there's anything I can do as a liaison with the rest of the crew that they can, they, that's an open conversation, something that can be explored. Um, but I try to, I try to say all that, but be kind of sweet and nice at the same time. And, um, and across the board, it's worked. Almost everybody has written back and yeah, I've got like really nice emails from people like John Lithgow who are like, no one's ever written this before. This is a really sweet thing to get from a DP. And so like, to me, that was, it was sort of an obvious move, but, but maybe there's, you know, some precedent as to how far below or above the line one is able to correspond on these uh, kind of things. But um, I, you know, it's, it's kind of basic stuff. I, I think it's like, it, you just, it, you know, Lynn and I always called it um, over communicating. Like it just, like just in case there's any doubt that you think somebody might not be able to reach out to you uh, as a collaborator, just eliminate that by just reaching out to them and saying, I'm here, you know, I'm a person, I, I know this is a long day. Let's see what we can do to figure it out. Um, I, I have found that, um, uh, relationships with cast uh, are, I mean, they're always important, but I think it's more even uh, more acutely important um, on episodic stuff because um, I've never done an episodic show where I've shared the DP credit with another uh, cinematographer as a regular thing. Every now and then, like I might have to leave for a day and somebody would take over. Um, but uh, when you're on a show and every week and a half, there's a new director um with a different skill set with a different way of communicating with a different um agenda for their storytelling with a different way of um interacting with crew and cast and producers and like you know being a being a, a director on television series is tricky you're like a guest um you're a guest that needs to know the rules of the house as soon as you walk in uh and so to you know to mitigate the the sort of like almost like schizophrenia of a different director every 10 days or a week or every two weeks uh i'm there every day and i'm 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 around and like you know i would never i would never overstep uh and offer any kind of i would never get into the director territory as a cinematographer on a show like that but um just like i'm there at lunch every day i'm around like i i know what a bad day might be like for a particular actor and i know what a good day might be like for a particular actor and like if if i see something starting to to head into a territory where someone might not feel as emotionally uh, available or vulnerable as a performer, I, I can like pull a director aside and be like, sometimes this doesn't go so well. Um, let me know if there's anything you want to do, but I can tell you from being here for the last 10 weeks that like, um, you know, it, it, it'll go a little better if you try a different tact, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really important that, you know, on features, I feel like I was lucky enough kind of coming out of Seattle and doing things like Safety Not Guaranteed and Your Sister's Sister, where um, the filmmaking was kind of a destination for like, it's like, it's almost like adult summer camp or something where you just, everybody's going somewhere and they're making this movie and they have this project, but they're also all friends and they're all sort of indebted to each other as human beings because they're a community. Um, those kind of films, it's more, it, it always felt more like we're welcoming performers into our our world and we're really excited that they're there and everybody really wants them to feel um, involved and invested in and valued. Um, so, I, you know, I never had the, I never felt like I needed to offer anything outside of like, you're meeting me first in this email. These are all of my friends. They're really cool. Just watch and you know, and everybody has a good time. Um, it's a little different than, than uh, you know, needing to sort of be the consistent face of the, the, um, the crew every day uh, for, you know, a uh, 40, 50 day shoot for an episodic. Yeah, no, and it sounds like that that approach really paid off because in terms of your directorial debut with a feature, Banana Split, that was actually the case of Hannah Marks, who you had worked with at the Sundance Labs, feeling like, you know, you struck up a friendship through the fact that you'd shot scenes together and she really trusted you. And initially it was feedback on a script that turned into you directing it, which is incredible. And, you know, I wanted to ask you about that in terms of you've had such a front row seat to directors doing their job, which is such a rarity. There's usually, you know, 99% of the time there's one director on set, so they never get to see how other people approach it and do it. And I was interested, particularly with first time filmmakers, because you've worked with so many, what are some of kind of the pitfalls, either in terms of approach or the way that they communicate or the fear that, that is naturally there that you've, you've seen them fall into that you really tried to make sure that you strayed away when you were in that position? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, 
That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel very lucky to have, have worked with a lot of a lot of first time filmmakers and like, you know, there there are a few sort of I don't know, pitfall pitfall might be the word, right word, but it's more of like a, a tendency. Um I, I think a lot of a lot of what I'm about to say probably comes out of the film industry having this culture of like, um, here's the newest, hottest filmmaker, they're this total genius, they made this movie. Instead of being like, here's a group of filmmakers that work together to make something amazing. Like when Barry Jenkins talked about Medicine for Melancholy or Moonlight, he talked about our film, talking about his crew and his cast and his community. Um, and that, to me, that's like a, it's, it should not be a revolutionary idea, but it kind of is in the way that um, people theorize and interact and, and talk about filmmaking. Um, and the reason I think it's, it's kind of detrimental is that I got into a lot of situations with first time filmmakers where they felt like they needed all of the answers. And they felt like they needed to have an answer for everybody, even if they were out of their depth technically, or um, which happens more often, they're out of their depth as far as like working with actors. Like the actor was this giant question mark kind of thing. And like, there's all this emotional work um, that doesn't doesn't make sense if you're you know you you you've been writing a script as a as a first time writer director and you're in a room for two years and all of a sudden an actor is saying your words and it's not what you've heard in your head, um, you know it's I, I think that it it comes down to saying like I don't have all the answers. Um, what I do have around me if I've done my homework is I've hired a lot of people that are smarter than me, better at their specific job than me, are here to support me. Um, and, that, and that it's that there is actually the film will be better if you sort of raise a white flag quietly and be like, I don't know how to get out of this problem. What do you what do you think? Um, and I found that that's that's a rare thing to have. And I understand it's like, I, you know, the, the moment of I from I want to be a director and I wrote this thing to this is my first day on set and there's 40 strangers looking at me is terrifying. And it's also I think if you have any any self-doubts, any doubts about the quality of your script, any, you know, any of those like lingering things and any of that baggage that everybody has, um, really, you, you have to do some proactive uh, emotional gymnastics to get to a place where you're like, I know what this needs to feel like. It's not feeling like that right now. And we, and I need some help. Can I ask some questions? Yeah. And the biggest thing is that people were afraid to ask questions. Yeah. In terms of, of, your cinematography work as well. I imagine that the pre-production process is probably one of the most important periods of time for you as you're getting ready to go on and, and shoot. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that and what your process looks like when you first get that script and you're considering taking on a project or you've just said yes to something, what mm -hmm. the first steps are that you take and what are some of the questions that you walk into the room with the director, the producers and the rest of the crew asking and needing to know to be able to put everything together on your end. For sure, for sure. I mean, I think the biggest thing leading up to that moment, like the, I never quite know how to articulate it, but the best I can do is like, if I'm reading a script and it's, it seems fun or it seems interesting or it seems smart, I, I know how much effort this is to do, to take a, to, to do a feature at 90 minutes. I mean, it, it varying degrees of effort, but it's always a lot. It always takes a long time and a lot of effort from everyone. Um, and so in the back of my head, I'm always like, is the world going to be better for this story? Like, is this a thing, not that it needs to be made right now, but like, are we doing anything detrimental by making this? Are we helping anybody? Are we offering a voice that has not been heard? Are we considering a thing that has not been considered? Are we adding to a conversation that needs to happen? That stuff is always important. It's even more important now. And so once the, that sort of mental tango is, has finished and I'm like, okay, I'm on board. Um, I, I like to come in as a listener first. And so for with the director, it's sort of like, what, what, what do you, you know, what do you think? What are you seeing? And sort of get a sense of, you know, their um, kernel idea for, for the, why a project should be made, what they want to really get out there. Most people have a sort of secondary agenda, which I really love. I, you know, I love that the words on the page flow and that it's funny and that it's smart. And it's got a beginning and a middle and an end, but I, what I really love is that, that people, that a lot of people are adding to a larger discussion. Yeah. So it's nice to sort of get into that and in getting into the sort of, why do you want to do this? What do you, what are you seeing the, you know, if we get to premiere this film and people are asking you wonderful questions and we go out into the lobby and someone comes up to you and says, Oh my God, your movie was amazing. Here's why, what do you want them to say? Um, that, that usually spurns the more, 
kind of nuts and bolts questions that are like um, really about getting on the same page visually, getting on the same page emotionally. Like, what what is this film like? What is this film not like? What does this film pull ideas from? What does this film reject ideas of? Is it, are your ideas even visual? Is this literature, is it, are, you know, are you just taking this from like some poetry you heard and, and now we've got to figure out how to make that feeling yeah. uh, visual? Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's like starting with this nebulous, like, why do you want to make this? What do you really want it to be? What are we putting out in the world? And as you start to talk about that, um, it, it becomes this much like tighter little ball. And then all of a sudden it's a thing you can kind of hold and look at. And um, those conversations, like they meander a little bit and they take a little time and then they start to really solidify. And I, I feel like if they're done well, by the time you get into full swing pre-production where you're, you're hiring crew members and you're talking to um, uh, you're you're talking to camera teams and lighting teams and um, uh, costuming teams. It, the the hope is that all of the key um, collaborators are on the same page because they all know what this little thing is, and they all more importantly know what it isn't. And so, um, you know, my my hope is by the end of all these, what is this? What isn't this? You've you've developed a, a shorthand as collaborators, and you developed a shorthand as friends. Uh, and it's, it eliminates um, kind of stressful moments on set where it takes 20 minutes to figure out if we're, you know, if we're, if we're using the right color blue because we were tracking blue for a different character in a moment, you know, it's just like everybody kind of gets dialed in in these, in these pre-production uh, talks. Yeah, and in terms of, of your collaborative relationship with directors, particularly at that part of the process as well, what's the most valuable tool that they can give you in terms of the way that they communicate their vision? You know, I know some directors really love to, to throw out other films and watch movies together or to put together vision boards. Like, what's the most valuable thing that they can do for you in your position? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think in the beginning, um, the, the two biggest things, one is the, the most valuable thing is to, to know that I am 1000% okay with them saying, I don't know the answer to this. And I'm 1000% okay with them saying, uh, I need help. Um, if I know that somebody can do that, I know that we're gonna be okay. Um, where, I, where I get nervous is when people start to shoot in the dark and they start to panic and they, they start to issue sort of decrees and mandates and none of the crew knows why we're doing what we're doing. It's just because the director said that we're doing that, which is our job. We're there to support the director, but um, she or he may not know what's, um, what's <laughs> what, what they want, you know? And it, like, if they just said, I don't know what I want, it, it's easier for everybody to be like, all right, pause. What's this scene really about? And it becomes clear. Um, so that's, that's one thing uh, on a more practical level. Um, I just, it's, if someone is writing and directing movies and trying to, they love movies or they love cinema or they love the feeling they get from cinema. They're not a novelist or they're not a novelist anymore. They're not a playwright. They're not a painter. This is how they're expressing themselves. So I, uh, the assumption, and I think it's almost across the board always right, is that they're able to talk about what they love and don't love in cinema. And they're able to, they're, you know, uh, it's, I think it's just as successful for me to talk to someone for 10 minutes and they're, and they're like, it's Minnie and Moskowitz. It's kind of like Goodfellas, but not when it gets super violent. I needed to feel like Romeo and Michelle's high school reunion for this scene. And like that, I, I got it. But, it, you know, um, some people work better with, a, with a, a board and a, you know, a really like beautifully made PDF. And like, that's, that's great too. But I, you know, I would never, I would never scoff at a director for, for showing up at a first meeting and being like, all right, I just, sorry, I was writing all day yesterday. This is what I was thinking. Bleh. And like, I can totally work with that. We start talking images and we start talking what we love about cinema. It's going to be fine. Yeah, that's so fantastic. And I feel <laughs> I've learned so much from this conversation. I feel like you, you could talk for hours in, in after class settings and people would take so much away from it. So thank you so much for taking time to Oh talk. my God, anytime. Yeah, please. This is wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you.